Good afternoon. We are starting the next class seminar. Today we have with us Matteo Lucio, who will be speaking about modeling biological automata. So um, I will redirect the camera on him. Now, it should be all work. So, Matteo, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, well, thank you for this kind invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And um, actually, uh, this talk follows the talk that I gave in Granada, uh, where I <clears throat> was, the, the talk in Granada was more philosophical because I compared the, the way uh, goal directedness can be conceptualized from a cybernetic point of view with the the, the notion of good directness stemming from the theory of logical autonomy. And uh, <clears throat> my goal today is to uh, go a bit further with uh, this discussion and actually presenting uh, a paper actually that I wrote uh, two, three years ago with uh, Leonardo Bic, University of Basque Country, and Anna Soto, which is the biology of Tufts University. Uh, which is uh, about uh, the, the way we can elaborate models of specific uh, phenomena by relying on some of the core concepts of the theory of biological autonomy as is being uh, developed these, uh, these years. So how do I move forward like that? So that's the, the so this is the, the paper that I'm referring to. This is... Uh, Cocktail of the, the talk is based on that, and uh, the my my goal here is to explore and uh, the capacity that the theory of autonomy has to support original modeling strategy. What does it change when we model specific phenomena if we apply uh, the concepts stemming from this theory? Because what must be said is that there are very few models, like existing models, that are actually based on uh, this set of this theory or this set of concepts. Uh, so, to try to make a step forward in this direction, we uh, propose a sort of uh, proof of concept, uh, which is not a real model, it's a sort of an illustration of how things could change if we uh, uh, use the main concept of the theory of autonomy. And once again, uh, uh, the, the main <coughs> alternative, which is widespread in, in, uh, in physiology, uh, literature is uh, models centered on feedback loops uh, to model the, the, the phenomenon that we are focusing here, here is the, the homeostasis of uh, glycemia in, in mammals. So the glycemia being the concentration of uh, sugar in uh, blood plasma. And uh, we, we, I will discuss the, the result of this, uh, of this try. And uh, the idea could be that uh, autonomy can generate, in some respect, richer description of the regulation of glycemia, uh, in particular because of its capacity to make explicit different hierarchical orders, functional orders involved in this, in this uh, phenomenon. That's the plan. So we started with what could be called the standard representation of uh, uh, glycemia uh, regulation, which is, there are many, many papers after this, an entire literature based on uh, uh, feedback loops, uh, using the both positive and negative uh, loops. Uh, we try to make a sort of synthesis of uh, most, most papers, so sort of general representation of uh, the main ideas. And uh, we are particularly referring to one paper, uh, one review paper by model and collaborators, which is called, if I remember correctly, a physiology view on homeostasis. So how this idea is applied to physiology when modeling uh, and glycemia. Uh, if we take the standard representation in terms of uh, feedback loops, uh, uh, what most of this paper uh, emphasize is that we need a set of functions a set of elements uh, playing different functions. So I put here the list so that we can, uh, we, you can uh, know what we extracted from this literature. So 
feedback loops involved in uh, the similar regulation usually uh, refer to imply the existence of at least five functions. So a device, a mechanism that establishes the, the normal range at the set point, the values of the regulated variables. So I know that this is perfectly obvious to you here, but uh, uh, let me check whether <laughs> this is a fair way of describing the, the essential points of, the, of these models. A sensor that measures the actual value of the regulated variable uh, and provides a sensory signal in response. A detector that compares the actual value through the, sen the sensory signal with the normal range. And the result of this comparison between the, the actual value and the normal range is an error signal, which is called misdeliver for an error signal. This is sent to controllers. The controller interprets the error signal and determines through a control signal the value of the outputs of the effector. And the system must include also effectors that respond to the control signal and modify the value of the regulated variable. So that's the, the abstract, uh, the set of functions that are involved in this, uh, in this uh, process and mechanism. And that's what we did the, uh, was to apply this schema to the specific uh, phenomenon and the system. Uh, so in, <clears throat> there are two situations. Of course, the situation during fasting when the mama is not eating or is so the basal situation, the basal condition. Uh, the can see we, uh, the liver, which is the main effector in this system, breaks down stored glycogen uh, all the time. So the glycogen, glycogen, glycogen is the uh, molecule that in, it is the form of glu glucose uh, which is stored. It is in this form that glucose is stored in in the in the organism in this form. Glucose being the main source of uh, one of the main sources of energy in a mammal metabolism. So uh, we have a sort of amount of glycogen which is stored. And uh, during um, normal, uh, the basal situation, uh, the liver breaks down stored glycogen through a, a process called gl glycogenolysis. Uh, and this effect is that gl glucose is secreted into the bl bloodstream and uh, uh, feeds the cells. Uh, now, uh, the, the, the regulation uh, starts when there is a disturbance, a perturbation, and uh, it, typically food intake when we eat. Uh, in, and so through uh, the digest, uh, digestion and absorption, uh, there is an increase of glycemia. So the concentration of glucose increases in the systemic circulation. Uh, and this uh, increased amount uh, reaches of organ, organs. And in particular, uh, the increased amount of glyce increasing glycemia is sensed by the chemical sensors that are in the pancreas and in the hypothalamus. Uh, according to the, mod the model, uh, the, the pancreas and hypothalamus emit signals, uh, so sensory signals that are sent, sent to the detector, which in this case is in the literature is not that clear where the detector is in the organism, but you can infer that most physiologists presuppose that it is located uh, in, in, the, in the pancreas. Uh, and at the same time, there is the, the, the model suppose that the set point is set by some device in the organism and there is, we did not find any clear uh, indication where this set, this, uh, this device that uh, uh, sets the, 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 uh, the normal range is located. In any case, the, uh, the pancreas place also the, the detector uh, uh, estimates the difference between the normal, normal range and the signal sent by uh, itself and the hypothalamus. And uh, as a result, send an error signal to the controller, which is also located in the pancreas. So the pancreas plays many functions in this, in this model. Uh, And at that point, the, the controller reacts to this error signal by sending signals, uh, control signals. And the two main uh, signals are sent to, are carried by hormones, by no hormones, one is insulin, and the other is the glucagon. So by two different kinds of cells that are located in the pancreas, the beta cells that 
release insulin and the alpha cells that release the glucagon. And they react in the opposite way to the, the uh, in, in, they react to either the increase of glycemia or the decrease of the glycemia, one inhibiting the other. And according to the situation, so there is a release of insulin or glucagon. Uh, when uh, insulin is released, um, the easy effect is to promote uh, different processes, glucose uptake, so increasing the absorption of uh, glucose by uh, the cells, in particular by the my muscles that needs glucose to, to, to produce physical activity, but uh, just to feed any, any cells. And also the conversion of glucose to gly glycogen so that it can be stored in the fat cells in the liver cells. So there are two ways uh, in which insulin operates and uh, by in, um, either consuming, inducing an increase in, uh, in increased consume, uh, consume of, uh, of glucose or in storage. As a result, uh, glycemia decreases, so the concentration of glucose decreases and, uh, and the cycle uh, uh, starts again because when the, 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 the level of glycemia is under a certain level, then the other cells act activate and uh, glucagon is secreted. And what glucagon does is a different way. So it induces the glycogenolysis, so the, breaks, the, the breaking down of a stored glycogen so that glucose can be released in the, in the, in the bloodstream and feed the cells. And this, 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 is, this represents us a classical uh, feedback loop that tends to uh, uh, bring the system to the homeostasis of the level of, uh, of glucose in the, in the, in the bloodstream. Um, of course, this is the not uh, all, of, uh, all of nothing or nothing process. So uh, uh, of course the pancreas is uh, secreting uh, uh, glucagon insulin all the time. And the question is whether it, what the, the model explains is the uh, increase or decrease, sudden increase of uh, release according to the, the, what the, 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 the level of glycemia, which is sensed by the, the, the pancreas and hypothalamus. So this is uh, a quick uh, representation of the, uh, of the model. And um, let's, have, let's make some comments on how this uh, model works. Um, one important aspect is that uh, the functional components, so those that are represented by the uh, square, uh, squares, are included in the system as independent objects. So their existence in the system is independent from the uh, dynamics that are uh, modeled uh, by this model, by model by uh, this case. The focus is on the circular relations between couple variables, in which case the, con the free concentrations, what matters here the, the relations between the concentration of glucose, glycemia, the concentration of insulin, and the concentration of glucagon. And the relation within the three uh, concentration explain the, uh, the homeostasis of glycemia. Oh, this is, I was, was mentioning, is, is, a, is a widespread, and it is a very useful tool to evaluate uh, the organism's ability to blunt the increase of, uh, of glucose, uh, and also uh, used to uh, evaluate normalcy or uh, pre-diabetes diabetes or diabetes situation. So you can make a test, you can feed an organism with glucose and then uh, uh, measure the, the level of uh, insulin uh, minutes later. So the model of the relation gives you an idea of uh, the, the health of the, of the, of the system. One of our uh, the reasons, one inspiration in, in making this work is that most functional topological and hierarchical features of the organism remain hidden precisely because the, the model is focused on what is, are supposed to be the relevant variables uh, at, at play in this, in explaining this phenomenon. And the, the, the purpose of the, of the model is not to, ex, to explain organism in general, the, the organization, their physiology, but to focus on this, on this specific phenomenon. So the understanding of organism control of glycemia in general is reduced because not too many functions are involved in this, uh, in this model. 
in, in, in the paper, we try to make explicit some of the weaknesses of, uh, the, of this uh, modeling strategy. Um, we distinguish between four aspects, which have not the same importance, of course. Some of them are more important than others. Uh, one is that uh, they, uh, most of this paper tend to uh, um, ascribe functions in a neat way. So there are um, each, uh, each structure uh, tra tend to play a specific function. Um, and uh, while what we can can be uh, uh, the problem with that is that it's a bit difficult. I, we do not see in these models a specific attention to the fact that most functions actually jointly realized by many uh, many uh, uh, and many structures, and also that some of them are not lo not not really lo localizable. So we they we do not really, really we don't need where such function is performed in the system. Uh, the second point, which is conceptually more, more important, is that the representation is, in a sense, flat. Uh, we have a chain of interacting components. So that's uh, uh, that produce a loop by a, uh, where the connection, the relation between the different functional objects are on one kind, actually. There is one kind of interaction, which is in terms of activation or inhibition of one element with relation to the other, which is also one of the strengths of on a typical aspects of the system. So the, the, the ontology, in a sense, is relatively simple. We have functional objects and activation inhibition relations. The third point that we uh, emphasize is that this kind of model do not uh, encourage complexifying the description. Uh, precisely because uh, the starting point is a, a strong abstra abstraction from most biologic, from most aspects of biological organization, just to focus on the relation between the couple variables. The most, most complexity is uh, hidden in, this, in the system. And, is not that clear to what extent the model would induce complexifying the description if the focus is on the target variables. And of course, one aspect is the fact that the, the set point is the set point is presupposed by the model. And of course, uh, this is sensible. But for instance, one question is: there is no account on how could be modified by the dynamics of the systems. So in, in most of these models, the, there, is a, there is a normal range which is set from the beginning, and there is no explanation of, no physiological explanation of what can change this, uh, this uh, the set point. Presumably, most of these uh, biology would say that evolution set the set, the, the, something like that. Uh, but th there is no part of the discussion this, in these models. Um, our own impression is that um, the representation uh, relies, this connects to some of the points that I was already mentioning in Granada, uh, between organisms and machines. Uh, most of these uh, weaknesses, in a sense, seems to uh, re uh, rely on uh, this epistemological attitude, which consists in modeling the system as if, at least with respect to the effect of understanding uh, homeostasis, the analogy with, with machines or with artifacts were operational. And of course, this explains why, in many cases, the, the, the model works because there are common aspects, but also crucial differences. Um, and some of the, I mentioned a couple of so the differences would uh, concern at least two aspects. One is homeostasis in itself. Uh, from a biological point of view, one could say that homeostasis is not a goal in itself for the system, it's a mean. The goal being staying there, being self-maintenance, uh, uh, maintaining some condition of existence, which means that uh, 
in many situations, homeostasis is conducive of staying alive. But there are, could there could be two uh, uh, at least two uh, um, uh, alternatives. One is that homeostasis could be achieved in different way, not with the same uh, mechanism. And also that there is inconceivable that uh, alternative behaviors, not homeostatic behaviors, and variation of homeostasis uh, happen and happen often in a biological system, in an organism, in his daily interactions. Um, and the other, so the the the, the role of uh, of the homeostasis um, could change if we think about the question of the goal, the fundamental goal in system and, and the hierarchy, hierarchy, hierarchy of goals in an organism. And the other example is the normal range. Uh, if we are focusing on the homeostasis variable, we can presuppose the normal range because this is not what, what you want to explain, you want to explain homeostasis. But if you want to explain how the, an organism works, then the process that sets the, norm, the, the normal, the normal uh, range is part of what you want to explain. Uh, and it is also highly debatable from, uh, for reasons that I will mention from an uh, organist, organismal and, uh, point of view, that uh, the, uh, set, the set point, the device that, uh, that there is something like a device that sets a set point. Uh, and the reason why we did not find any mention of that in the literature could be for fundamental reasons, not just that no one has looked, uh, tried to look for the, the, the device that sets the, the normal range. This is correlated to energy expenditure of the organism, the, the normal range. It's how much energy can be expended in a given Yeah, time. yeah. So it's uh, a relationship between the organism and the environment. Yeah. Now, yes, so there, there is something, yes, there is something that actually uh, regulates, determines, but how is that is that I, is, so there could, hypothesis can be done, but uh, I didn't find a, a discussion of that space specifically. Now, um, what happens if we uh, introduce in this issue in this question, um, ideas coming from uh, autonomy, the theory of autonomy. Uh, I will be relatively quick about that because <laughs> uh, uh, there is a preceding talk, but please ask me questions if this is too, too, too generic. Um, the idea of biological autonomy uh, refers to a specific kind of adaptive agential organization. So being autonomous means being a natural system, a material system that is organized in a specific way so that in particular is able to self-determine his own, at least in part, his own condition of existence, behave as an agent and be an adaptive system. And autonomous systems uh, maintain themselves uh, in, of course, far from equilibrium conditions, uh, which, which means uh, that they the, in highly improbable dynamic distribution of energy and matter by controlling the thermodynamic flow. So there is a huge deal with, about control when dealing with autonomy. Control is exerted in this theory, at least the way I see, <laughs> interpret this theory, is exerted by molecular and supramolecular structures going from enzymes to membranes, tissues, organs, actually anything to which a function can be ascribed that act as constraints on the thermodynamic flow. And some of the constraints, the crucial idea here is not only that we have these constraints, but that at least some of the constraints are produced and maintained by the system. That the, the crucial Kantian move uh, from the, of the theory of autonomy. If I understand well, your concept of constraint, it's not just limiting the normal flow, but it's also kind of canalizing, guiding, or stimulating the flow. Yeah. Uh, okay. We 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 have provided a formal definition of of a, of a constraint. <coughs> is uh, fundamental what you are saying. So I put a bit more here. 
A constraint is a structure that has a causal effect on a process. So you have to, to, to identify a process or a transformation uh, at the relevant time scale, which requires defining a time scale. And a constraint is an entity that modifies this in different ways, this process, while being locally unaffected. So there is a, a, a property of conservation uh, that can be ascribed to the constraint at the relevant time scale, at the relevant time scale, uh, by the process in which it takes uh, place. Uh, in a sense, one can say that constraints play the role of local boundary conditions that enable specific process to take place by reducing the degree of freedom. Uh, and by doing do so, they locally channel the flux of energy mat or matter processes, chemical reactions, whatever, to our outcomes uh, that are functional, so that are, play a role in maintaining the condition of existing system. And that would be extremely improbable or actually impossible in uh, biological time scales in the absence of such constraints. Mm -hmm. So you have the, the, the example of the vascular system that transports a molecule of oxygen from one point to another point by transport. So the same outcome could happen by diffusion, not by active transport. But the chances that it actually happened would be it, nothing impossible in physics, but in, in, at the relevant time scale for biology would, would not, not happen, not, would do not happen. So you need the constraint to make that but happen. I'm still a little bit um, confused. Constraint, as you say, is a limitation of degrees of freedom. But the definition of constraint, it limits your freedom. But I see constraints also you say, as enablers. Exactly. I'm thinking about a catalyst, which makes something possible that wasn't possible before. So it's actually increasing the degrees of freedom. Yeah, because by you have a set of possibilities by reducing, by uh, making some options not available, you increase in the chances that the other happen. Uh, in I that sense, I, 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 this enable is, one thing by excluding everything else. Exactly. Actually, this is, this, is some, this is a discussion that existed with the respect of notion of constraint from uh, our party. And there's this double notion of constraint that's limiting or, or, or uh, enabling. As I see it, the two notions, in spite of the way that they look uh, antagonistic to lay go together because to, by unless you are limiting everything the very fact of uh, uh, limiting some reducing or uh, forbidding some outcomes well enhances the chances that the other uh, uh, because you're modifying the distribution so some other outcome uh, will happen more likely <laughs> yeah so i'm still wondering whether a catalyst is just enabling a reaction by excluding random diffusions or whether it's adding something more mm. it doesn't exclude it just uh, lower the level of energy which is which is necessary for a certain chemical reaction to to take place so it does not exclude constraint, or is that yeah? But constraint, I think uh, you, you can relate to it both in the mathematical sense, and then it's more like uh, setting a range of parameters and not necessarily something in some things and not others. It's so you can take it as a physical in the physical sense, but also in the mathematical sense, it are not entirely overlapping. Mm. Because usually, on the physical sense, this is a constraint. You cannot move through it, but yeah, in, but you can you can jump on it. Yes. Yeah, so, but mathematically speaking, it has a different meaning. Yeah. What constraint means? It's yeah. Like setting a certain range of uh, functional changes or. Yeah. yeah. So. I really have the intuition that two aspects actually go together, uh, but it is true that there is no formal and. Uh, so what we, we, what we did is provide a definition where a constraint has a conserved property that must be identified at the time scale for the, for instance, the configuration of the, of the enzyme at the certain time scale. And that property is what explains its effect on the process. The question of is limiting, et cetera, it is, is actually, it is true that in this case, we must uh, grant the constraint uh, enabling capacity to make something that is unlikely actually happen. 
So there are two steps. One is the, uh, the, the idea of constraints, the distinction between processes and constraints, and uh, the, what the theory uh, claims is that in organisms, constraint relies closure. So this notion is an old notion, is as a sort of history in, in theoretical biology. So we use that in a sense that this comes from both Stuart Kaufman's sense and uh, Robert Rosen's sense in a sense. So there's this paper that we wrote that tried to make that explicit, mm -hmm. which means that in this situation, the, the existence and activity of a set of constraints depend on their mutual relation and interaction. Constraints are there because they are continuously maintained or rebuilt or uh, reproduced by, by the system that they constitute. This, uh, so this is a very simple representation of, uh, uh, of, a, of a closure where you have some, some constraints, for instance, this one that is enabling, is contributing to the system, but is not maintained by the system. Uh, C1, which is produced by this process, but is not playing a role that is put in this model uh, contributing to the system, while C3, C2, and C4 realize, realize closure because they are at the same time enabling a process and depend on a process that is constrained by another, it is uh, constrained by another uh, constraint in the system. So C3, C2, and C4 depend on each other, realize closure in this wider system. It's like an autocatalytic sense where the, the catalysts enable reactions, which in turn produce a catalyst. Yeah, and we made on purpose a catalyst which is more abstract than the kind the, the case of the, the catalyst, which, which is an, a possible application. But we wanted to also imagine higher level uh, catalyst mm -hmm. organs or whatever, mm -hmm. or even uh, ecological functions or something. So, provided that your entity meets the definition of a constraint. Uh, and so that's why I put there, but uh, intracellular and multicellular level. So the constraint can be described at different level of organization. Sorry, what, the, what was the second part of your closure? So it was at, at the same time enabling a process and then something else too? Depend. Oh, so okay. each constraint is there because it is maintained or, 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 or produced by a process of a set of, of course, there's a simplification by a set of reaction, et cetera, which are under the control of constraints, other constraints, those constraints being on, uh, depending on the constraint that we are looking at, that creates- It's a, kind of a bootstrapping of constraints. Yes. So this is the notion of closure. And that's first order closure. So just this, this definition, and you can have different kind of uh, systems that realize meet this characterization. This is a bit abstract because presumably there is no real organism that is just that simple. So first level of closure. Uh, presumably most organisms have much more complex capacities, one of them being adaptivity, uh, the capacity to modify, to modify the all first order regime in relation to internal or external perturbations. So what that means, and we, I'm, you know, I mentioned one paper that I wrote with Leonardo about this point, the, the, the description needs to add regulatory constraints and make sense of regulation from within the theory. What does regulation means? And we uh, claim that this requires uh, making the hierarchy more complex, so including second order constraints, which are such if they meet some uh, two conditions. One, they modulate first order closure, so they operate on other constraints, and they selectively induce shift between distinct available physiological or agential regimes. Um, one example is uh, regulation of bacteria chemotaxia, as you know, bacteria follow the gradient, uh, chemical gradients, and they can either uh, tumble or rotate. When they, when they reach a place where the gradient is uniform, they stop moving and moving in a, in a direction and they rotate just to eat, they stay there eat. And this, uh, the shift between the two regimes, the two motor regimes is an example of regulation where there are other functions that are, when uh, the, the, there's a difference, a change in the gradient, you need a change, you need a change again, induce a shift in the 
in this in this Cartesian first order uh, or, uh, regime. So you have these two uh, uh, two level of uh, hierarchical levels, and more precisely, a regulatory subsystem in an organism requires two, two things: to constraint on the one hand, a constraint that act as second order controllers, which means that they modulate the activity of other constraints, where constraints over the first order are operating on processes and reactions. And you also need constraints that are specifically sensitive to variations in internal or inter external conditions. Um, and when they, they sense this variation, they, they, they perform in a qualitatively different actions. So actually they, what they do happens only when <coughs> there is a change that is occurring. Uh, that's what I, I put here. Uh, so regulations, regulatory functions operate only in the presence of a change, which is not what happens for, uh, in first order uh, um, constraints and first order regimes. The, the, the general picture is the, 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 the biological autonomy as a, uh, as a hierarchical, cons, uh, hierarchical uh, regime where regulation plays a sort of uh, con context sensitive capacity depend on the context. And actually, this is actually one of the points that Ezekiel Di Paolo makes in a quite famous uh, paper where he describes adaptivity, when he says, well, an adaptive system, a system that is not just working, but is able to modify its behavior where and anticipate possible del deleterious uh, fut future events and modifies its behavior uh, in advance so as to prevent, to go out from a viability domain. Uh, so if he, the question of the, the main point of the paper was uh, trying to use these ideas to uh, um, reinterpret uh, uh, the, uh, the model of, uh, of, control of glucose regulation. So, and the, 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 the primary point was how do we have a procedure? Is these ideas, are these ideas providing a procedure to, uh, to elaborate models? And are, of course, uh, there are at least four steps that seems to be necessary in this, in this, in this uh, framework. One, the first thing that one has to do is to identify the relevant processes for explaining the phenomenon at the relevant time scale. I insist on the fact that almost everything here is a matter of time scales. Second step, identification of the first order constraints that operate on the target processes. Determination of the uh, dependencies between the relevant constraints so as to obtain closure. And then identification of high order constraints, regulatory systems, by distinguishing in particular between controlling and sensitive constraints, which usually are not the same object in an organism. So this gives a sort of initial procedure that, that we thought is important to check whether these theories can be applied in an, and if applied in an original way to model Do you necessarily already need the closure of constraints at the lowest level? Could it just be that the constraints are constraining the feedback loop and that they don't need to be generated from somewhere else? Oh, say again. Uh, what do you mean? So that, that, the, the, at the lowest level, it seems to me that you just need to say that the concerns do not necessarily need to be self generating via disclosure. Uh, the, the answer is I do not know. So uh, there must be a general closure. Given that at the higher yeah, level, yeah, but it's given that regulatory constraints are constantly dependent. In principle, this means that there might be a situation where regulatory constraints never uh, are never activated because the organism never encounters the situation where, of course, it's a very abstract situation where this perturbation occurs. Those second order constraints could never be required to operate, in which case your system will stay with the first order. And if it is an organism, the idea is that then will be set, will be self maintaining at the first order. So given that second and third orders, higher orders are context dependent, it seems to imply that you need closure from the first, from the uh, starting from the first level. 
Well, I think closure in the sense of a feedback loop, which is closed, but the feedback loop that is closed is not necessarily closure of constraints. No, 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 yeah, no, no. It's, it's, it's a simple form of closure. No. Yeah, I think that uh, it, this definition of regulations as constant dependent, which means that it, 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 this function uh, operate only in specific situations that might not happen. If, if they do not, then it means that all, all the work is done by the first order constraints. And if what they are supposed to do is maintain themselves, then you need closure of constraints at the first order by, by construction, in a sense, I think. Yeah, because closure also implies some structural consequences. It's when there is closure, there is usually some boundary where this closure operates. You even uh, made it on this yeah, diagram. Yeah, yeah. So there is a boundary and the boundary, this, this is very interesting. In, in, if, you, if you follow this way of thinking, the boundaries are, are functional boundaries, of course. They, they are materialized by some physical. Yeah, they are also physical. They are also physical, but the boundaries are in, in principle functional. So what gives you the boundary of the system is the set of constraints that are subject to closure. This is what your system is. And of course, in practice, so for this system to exist, you need, you need boundaries in the, in, the, in the physical sense. But there are, as you, as you know, in biology, there are many, many, many uh, borderline cases. So uh, for instance, we are holobionts. Uh, so some of the microorganisms that uh, live with us are not within our boundaries. They are on, on the skin, for instance. So you can, if they play, if they, if they contribute to our uh, metabolism and are somehow maintained by us because we do something that in, enable its existence, then from a point of view of the theory, they are part of, of the same individual, even though they are beyond the physical skin. So you can have diverging conclusions where you are sticking on functional criteria over physical criteria, even though most of the time they go in the same direction for obvious reasons. Yes. We need to consider both of the Yeah. Not even physical, but structural. In the sense yeah. that it's some kind of material aspect. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, go back to our example. So those are the, the ideas. What happens if we try to uh, re-describe the same phenomenon by applying this, these ideas? Uh, in this uh, box, so you have the functional parts, which are the rectangular boxes, the constraints, are the blue arrows, process and transformations uh, dotted blue arrows, uh, which involves uh, um, the, the transformation under, underwent by, by the glucose. So is, actually, uh, there is by coming to uh, in a second. Uh, and constraints in red and green are those that affect glucose and glycogen concentration. So you have uh food intake you have an amount of glucose in the in the blood and then these glucose uh, i i realized yesterday that this little error in the in the graph so there is uh this dotted line goes here because glucose is transported so this is transport it's transported everywhere into any uh rectangular box to any structure which are fed by this control this transport and are fed by the and by the glucose. And the glucose is also undergoing glycogenesis. So it is stored as glycogen. And in that other situations, glycogen is, uh, uh, is um, broken uh, into glucose. So there are the two processes which are constrained as in the, in this, in the previous diagram by several constraints, what now play the role of constraints uh, and in particular, uh, the liver, uh, fat cells, uh, adipose uh, tissues, and muscular tissues that in some cases uh, constrain glyco glycogenesis. So uh, either, either because they just uh, consume glyco glucose or because they uh, uh, store glucose as glycogen. So this, in, this, in this representation, these objects play the role of constraints because they Canalize, they make possible a process which is a transformation of glucose from uh, the transformation from one kind of molecule to another kind of molecule. In, in the process. So uh, I didn't actually know the term glycogenesis means the genesis of glycogen. Yeah. 
It's a production reactor. Yeah. And, and gluconeogenesis means producing glucose from uh, something else. Than exactly. So they have made, so we are, I'm simplifying otherwise we're staying hours because, so the baby is a bit more complex, but uh, if, if there are a third process here, which is the gluconeogenesis, which is the organ is also capable of producing uh, glucose if needed by uh, so building blocks. So exactly. Yeah. And this process is, is, is um, constrained by liver, the liver also. Also this process that is, this is constrained by the, by the, uh, uh, the liver. This is one of the, it plays an important role of course in all this uh, process. And, uh, what, uh, what happens is that we manage to describe the closure in, the, in a very, very abstract way in the sense that all this process, all constraints involved in canalizing uh, the glucose transplant transformations are also maintained by the, the, the processes that they are collectively enabling. So the system here realized you know, a very schematic form of, uh, of closure. Um, Whereas the pancreas, because I remember the pancreas was pretty important in the first movie. Uh, no, wait. <laughs> Sorry, good question, but wait a second. Uh, so this is the basal condition. This is the first order. Uh, the first order. So in this, the system is able to keep working, and um, is as a form of dynamical stability. So we are. We, there is no regulation here. So as you were mentioning. The, the organ is all the time producing some uh, glucose, some gly glycogen. So these processes are working. Of course, it's not an all or nothing process. And in basal conditions, this, this system is also capable of some uh, stability because for instance, with no regulation uh, here, because for instance, uh, when uh, glycogenesis uh, happens, if there is more glucose, this accelerate this, if you have more input then your reactions, you, uh, you can have more uh, process of glycogenesis. And if you are accumulating too much glycogen, just uh, then the, the, this pathway uh, slows down because you have a lot of out, uh, product which is already stored. So you don't even need regulation just because of mass actions. You have uh, processes that can uh, slow down or accelerate just because of the structure of this, uh, this system. But of course, uh, uh, this up, this works only we have small uh, variations of look of glycemia, but the question of regulation uh, becomes necessary is needed in case of greater alteration of glycemia. For instance, when we eat, so suddenly we uh, the, there is much more uh, glucose and uh, uh, circulating in the blood, and then you need regulations, and then we have to add the regulatory subsystem. Uh, and that's where the pancreas appears, uh, here and here. Uh, beta cells, so, you, you, so we have also to, uh, there, there are many things to say. So uh, first, um, the, the, the process of the same that we were discussing before. So you have beta cells, which are in the pancreas. They are, sens they are sensitive to the increase of glycemia. And what they do is that they uh, actually um, exert a constraint on the vesicles within the cells that contain uh, insulin. They produce all the times that the insulin is uh, stored into the vesicles. And what they do is that when uh, um, they have too much glucose, the, a lot of glucose, they produce ATP. And so there is a ratio between ATP and DP within the cell. They sense this and uh, there is a, a change uh, uh, occurring in the, in, the, in the membrane, which fuses with the vesicle, the vesicle open, and the, the cell release insulin in the in the in the blood. Uh, so, what cells are doing is the vesicle is itself a constraint, the constraint that controls the release, the process being the release of insulin. So, cells, beta cells, are exerting a control over another constraint, which is the vesicle. Once you have the insulin, the insulin makes different uh, uh, second order. Uh, functions uh, because they, it promotes on one say intake, so the fact that cells consume more uh, glucose and the storage of glycogen. So uh, that's why we, we, we draw this way. So there is a secondary constraint operating on first order constraints, 
which are those that are in charge of uh, canalizing the process. So you see, the, we try to draw this, uh, the, the, this picture so that the, 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 the difference in relation between first order and second order constraints are, are explicit. And the other way around for uh, uh, alpha cells, uh, that of course are sensitive to the, the ratio between ATP and DP the other way around. So when the, the ratio is low, they sense they uh, release vesicles and they, they, they fuse the vesicle fuse and uh, glucagon is released, which produce a second constraint on the glyco, um, glycogenolysis. So the release, the breaking down of glucose. And so, so this is the same process, but we try to uh, express them in the form of this hierarchical uh, uh, diagram. Yes. Yes, maybe you will get to this, but um, does this free interpretation and also learn something new concerning diabetes, for example? Um, I, I'm saying a word about that, but okay. uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so, it, so that, that's the essential point. Um, and there's more, so, so the, 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 the take home message here is that we, can, we try to articulate this different kind of hierarchical processes. But of course we can go farther with it because one thing that is now known is that insulin, the, the release of insulin inhibits alpha cells. So uh, alpha cells are not just sensitive to the fact that there is low glycemia, but also to the fact that insulin is released in the organs. So there is an inhibition going from uh, uh, insulin to alpha cells, to what alpha cell does on their own uh, vesicles. So we thought about that. We said, well, if, if insulin is operating on alpha cells, then we have a third order constraints because, and that's we added the the, the the, the arrow, insulin is operating on the behavior of alpha cells. And this behavior has, is, is, has been uh, conceptualized as a second order constraint. So by constructions, what insulin does in this case is a third order constraint. Uh, and so we, we, we try to add that and uh, draw these inhibition as with this uh, <laughs> uh, transversal bar to say that it's stopping something. And of course, uh, uh, actually this, physiologically speaking, this phenomenon is, is very important because since the discovery of the role of beta cells on suppressing uh, uh, glucagon expression, this um, actually the centrality of insulin deficiency uh, was revaluated because diabetes, diabetes uh, the idea is that we, have, we do not secrete enough insulin, which me makes that we are unable to to, to reduce the, the level of, of glycemia. But if what, what happens is that the absence of insulin actually uh, suppresses the inhibition of alpha cells, what the organism does is that it releases glucagon. So it produces glu glucose. So the, because this, there is no inhibition coming from uh, insulin. So what happens is that if uh, is a double effect, right? so not only insulin uh, makes that we are not able to absorb uh, glucose, but that the organism produces, uh, produces more uh, gluco glucose because glucagon is released. There is no inhibition, glucagon is released. And then this process is happened. So the, 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 the concentration of glucose increases. And this is what is now called the B hormonal hypothesis on diabetes. So the two hormones which interact each other, actually the lack of one directly uh, induces the augmentation of the other. So. <laughs> and just to, so the, the point here is to show you that this would be conceptualized as a third order constraint. And of course, many others could be added. We just in the paper made some a couple of examples about here. Uh, uh, for instance, Anna Soto was explaining to me and Leo, we were, we were the philosophers, she was, she's the biologist, that uh, for instance, uh, uh, gut cells and brain exert third order constraints on 
beta cells because when we eat at the moment of ingestion of urine, when we see food, the brain sends signals to, to the pancreas so that we start producing uh, um, insulin even before uh, the, 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 glu the, the, the concentrate, the glycemia has increased. And if this, uh, oops, sorry, if this schema is correct, then this should be considered as third order constraint because they operate on what as second order constraint and so on. So if someone works in a bakery, they produce it over there? I don't know what happens. I mean, there's some sort of. <laughs> they maybe they learn but not not. This not this very 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 yeah. Sometimes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They tend to be a bit, yeah. <laughs> um, so now let's uh, examine this. So when compared to, to, to the standard representation, uh, it seems to us that uh, fair to say the ontology is richer because uh, here in this case, we have a distinctions. The, the model requires distinguishing, builds on a distinction between processes and constraints, which is a theoretical distinction <coughs> within the theory. A distinction between different orders of constraints, that's what I was showing you with this, <laughs> uh, and also between level of closure, because we, have, we can have different levels, unicellular, multicellular, within which you can have different orders of, of regulations. So that makes the, the hierarchy very complex. And also a distinction between controlling and sensitive regulatory constraints, which are parts of the same uh, subsystem. And this, in addition to the functional differentiation, so they play different roles, uh, and this is natural to the fact they are different as in the, in the of course, in the feedback uh, model. So the first point is a question about the, 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 the richness of the, of the, what I call the ontology, the theoretical ontology, the objects that are needed to make the model. Um, so model relying on feedback loops, focus on the relation between the variables. That was what I was saying at the beginning, that this, plan this planandum is that. Uh, models of autonomy that relies on closure, notably, seems to be able to derive the relations from the, these relations. So you can derive, you can explain uh, uh, the, the homeostasis of uh, glycemia uh, in, this, in this schema. Uh, but what, what, what the model tries to do is to uh, uh, place this phenomenon in the context of the functional organization of the system. Glucohemostasis is a manifestation, a consequence of the distinctive biological capacity of self-maintenance, the more general capacity. And the point seems to be that even given that the latter, latter can replace the former, so you can explain at least in principle, what you explain with feedback loops with organizational closure, but not vice versa, then the, the claim would be that we have more explanatory power with uh, a model coming from autonomy than from just feedback loops. So that's the main claim. Uh, because the explanatory focus shifted from the homeostasis of a variable to the self-determining autonomous organization. It's because what you want to explain is different. Even it's not disconnected, of course. Uh, do we make some progress with respect to the weaknesses that I was mentioning? Uh, well, it is, becomes complex, but quite normal to ascri ascribe several functions to the same component. So insulin is in many, many uh, uh, second order and third order. So you can multiply the relations because you have this soft guidance given by the, the hierarchy. Uh, or the description to a given function to a set of distributed structures. So the regulatory system implies different entities that must be uh, coupled uh, as it was mentioned. And given that what you are doing is locating a, a capacity within the organism, it's quite normal, it's natural for, for, uh, for um, a modeling strategy of this kind to search more function and integrate those functions in the model because it is obvious, perfectly obvious that this is a, is a very, very 
abstract representation. And uh, one important point is uh, quite actually the focus of this paper is that uh, there seems to be a way to uh, provide a theoretical specification of nested uh, hierarchical functional uh, orders. Objection. Uh, feedback loops are more are a more efficient tool to explain by homeostatic phenomena. If you what you want to explain is the homeostasis of a group of <coughs> glucose, you uh, feedback loops could be enough. And while bothering with making something much more complex, agree. But and then we go to uh, we go back to teleology in a sense. Uh, if it is true. If it's correct to, to claim that glucose homeostasis is not a goal in itself of the system, but a mean. So this philosophical claim has a consequence because this means that from the point of view of autonomy, uh, the organism is not meant to maintain homeostasis as a goal in as, as, as a goal in itself. What he has to do is just stay alive. This leaves room to variation and departures from a given range of hemostatic values. It is seems it becomes obvious that the point is not a, 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 set, a set point. It, it, this set point is an approximation and can is, depends on the context. Uh, it also have an implication for the, the norms, the normativity of biological system because deviations from the normal range are not necessarily bad, but most of the time uh, uh, are good. And the maintenance of homeostasis is not necessarily good. This goes, this goes with the idea of adaptivity, which is precisely the fact that you modify this, um, this, uh, this capacity according to the situation. And if once again, it seems to me that here the tension with the, the machines is, is clear because machines are designed for maintaining a given range. They, they, they are designed like for that purpose, which is not the purpose of the organism. So that insofar as there is good reason to think that the organism is as to maintain homeostasis of a variable, then it is likely that feedback looks play, uh, do the job. But that as soon as this is not what is going on, maybe a better explanation of, of the phenomenon requires situating the phenomenon in the organism. That's where the theory of autonomy can play a role, an original role. There are, of course, uh, it was obvious from the very beginning that there are challenges because uh, when, if you uh, try to model by applying these ideas, because one point is that you have to integrate a variety of processes, interactions, uh, and try to make the topological and quantitative relation explicit. We don't even know how to what signs use and and uh, how do how the model is supposed to be drawn so that is understandable. So we do, we did that, but there are many problems with that. Uh, so there are from the very beginning you did this uh, rich ontology uh, raise a problem for representation. And, uh, and that, as far as I know, there's not that much that we can easily use to, to, to make this uh, understandable, in the, even in the representation. That's why some, sometimes makes things simpler is, is advantageous because you can understand what's going on. Um, there are other problems because if you uh, accept that there is a fundamental disanalogy with the machine, and this goes with the fact that the functional parts of the organism are not the result of assemblage. So these parts are not being conceived and produced separately and then assembled. They have emerged by differentiation. So there is one cell at some point. So this, the fact that the, 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 the ontogenesis of the organism is, in, is radically different from the ontogenesis of a machine, of the fabrication of a machine, could make Functional descriptions very complex because it's not that clear where where a functional structure ends and the next one begins in biology. 
because of the nature of the system. Uh, because typically the same system can have different functions and yeah. uh, different functions can be, the same function can be spread over different systems. Exactly, that's what I was mentioning before. So this is, is interesting, but the, the, the drawback with that is that some cases you can be quite arbitrary to say, well, my regulatory, my regulatory subsystems begins here and, uh, and ends there. And of course, there's also a problem of representation of complexity. So uh, uh, organicist models of this kind uh, have to find a trade-off between precision and comprehensiveness. So you cannot represent everything, but in a, if you accept the closure thesis, this means that everything depends on everything. So you need a, a strong theory enabling you to select, to, to not, not only conceptually, how do we, select relevant information while keeping the essential information, but also procedure full zooming in or out. That's something that we did informally in our model. So we focus on some pathways and just put a vascular system on the other side. So these are huge zooming out of the system. So uh, you can do that on an informal conceptual basis, but maybe it would be useful to know whether some more formal uh, tools derived from the theory can be put to work to, to, to guide modeling strategies. Uh, our proof of concept seems to suggest that the theory has the resources to find trade-offs. So we were quite happy about the kind of object that we produced, but uh, of course, uh, maybe it is probably a, a, a workable theory is able to provide uh, formal guidelines to modelers so that they know how to uh, how to select information and uh, draw the, the model. And uh, that's all. So thank you very much. So these are my two co-authors, uh, Leonardo Bic and Anna Soto, that uh, worked with me uh, to write this this paper. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I quite like the way that you show that these things are indeed complicated, but on the other hand, we need to some degree try to cut through that complexity if you want to understand practical problems, like for example, diabetes. And it's part of the ontology that makes it easy or makes it difficult. And I agree with you that the simple feedback loops are not enough. But our approach, of which I can't say what it will solve your problem, but at least potentially could do it, is this chemical organization modeling where the constraints can be modeled as catalysts. So a catalyst is an enabler of a particular reaction. Without a catalyst, the reaction doesn't happen. But some reactions don't need catalysts. And that is a little bit what I lacked in your approach, in your approach, the same as in the approach of autocatalytic sets of Kaufman, etc. There is kind of the assumption that there always needs to be a constraint for a reaction to take place. Now, I think it would be more efficient if the organism would first of all let the reactions take place spontaneously and only use constraints for those reactions that otherwise would not take place. So that may already a little bit simplify the, 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 the modeling if you just assume that some some reactions happen just without constraints and that you need constraints for the more higher order kind of things that otherwise wouldn't happen. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the, there is no reason, a pure reason to think that any process of reaction happening in the organism requires uh, constraint. Uh, as far as I know, it is the case many times. So that's why we so we, uh, with an approximation as is always the case, but you're right, it's not necessarily the case. I'm not sure that this would simplify the description because if in practice, most of the time, process and reaction are organized, are coordinated, requires coordination. So some kind of constant is operating so that you have uh, the stoichiometry is, 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 works, et cetera, et cetera. My impression is that the, 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 the causal role, the functional role of constraint is indeed massive. But your point is correct in principle. Uh, I, I'm not so sure whether you need constraints for coordination because for me, coordination at the simplest level happens via stigma. That means that 
a reaction leaves a product and the product then stimulates the next reaction. So the, the concentration of things that are available is a kind of stigmatic taste of everything that has happened before and then a new reaction is triggered by whatever is there so in a sense all the processes are communicating via the fact that they are using what is called in in chemical organization theory the reaction vessel they are using the same reaction vessel in this case it might be they are using the same blood stream or they're using the same cell and the one reaction deposits its product in there and then the next reaction uses those products to do the next step so the coordination, in a sense, is easier than it would look to if you would design it as an engineer. If you would design it as an engineer, you would say, first, I need some process that turns A into B, and then I need another process that turns B into C, and then I need a third process that turns C into D. But if the processes are such that whenever there is a B, it's turned into a C, and whenever there is a C, it's turned into a D, then you no longer need to have these processes coordinated with each other. Yeah. They happen spontaneously because they are using a common substrate. So that is already one reason why I think you do not necessarily need constraints for coordination. Mm -hmm. Agree. Uh, it's partly this is an empirical reason, a empirical point, so that can be tested actually to what extent you need constraints. One thing that I would like to emphasize is that it is very important for me, for us, to, to have a characterization of constraints, which is general enough to be applied beyond uh, catalyzers. So a membrane is, is a constraint. Uh, you have, uh, you need, in, in biology, you need comp compartments. You need, uh, it, so it's not just, uh, the, the main example is the catalyst, but the vascular system, the the the, the lungs, uh, the skin, everything actually everything to which we can ascribe a function in our perspective is a constraint. So this is important for that reason. And uh, most operation actually, uh, I was quite shocked when I showed when someone showed me the, the image of a cell. We can see sort of vague image of a cell as a sort of uh, uh, as a compartment full of liquid, actually, a cell is extremely compacted, crowded. So even the movement, which seems to seem something that just happens because we are in a liquid situation, or no, is really dense. And it seems that we need uh, constraints also to explain how elements can move from one part to the other, even within a cell. Uh, not to mention the fact it's that not by diffusion. it's not only by diffusion. There not are, only by diffusion. There are many constraints operating. So I I cannot say that is that my my image is that the, the, the complexity of a even special multicellular organism is so high that some kind of coordination requires uh, constraint. But I agree with you on the. Uh, no, but I I very much like your sense of constraint in that way. I expect that what we call catalysts in chemical organization theory would encompass your consent because it's called chemical organization theory, but it's not about chemistry. Mm. It's about general reactions, A plus B gives C plus D, but it can be that there is what we then call a catalyst, A plus C gives B plus C, that means the C is remaining. The C is a constraint, the C is a catalyst, it is the thing that enables the transformation of A into B, and it's, it, it is not itself affected by the reaction. So in that sense, I think that all these other constraints can also expel, be expressed in the same language, and that's why I hope that this language may be a formalism that could help you to, to express these things more clearly. So we have a comment from Thomas. Thomas? Oh, there's Thomas. Yes, hello. Hello, everyone. This is Thomas here from Santiago. Um, luckily, I didn't miss your, your talk. It's quite early here. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mateo. Uh, I just have a, a very quick question around the, the discussion, uh, which is um, if, because the, in, in uh, of course, we will have to frame somehow this, this, uh, this, this, this talk within the language of reaction networks or some maybe beyond some kind of biological biochemical modeling pretty much we are in biochemical biochemical language and and the question is that in this uh, kind of molecular dynamics or reaction networks or clt or all these languages 
um, they speak a lot about the idea of emergence. And, and then I wonder if, and I have two questions. One is that whether these constraints you, we could uh, assume that are emergent from the possibilities and maybe the fact, which is something new I, I saw, the fact that these are normally open systems with received uh, input, uh, maybe energy or something like that. And this changes a lot the, the typical symmetry of, uh, of, um, of the classical thermodynamical systems where like you have equally likelihood of all states and so on. So when there, there is uh, openness, there is a, a huge uh, symmetry breaking on what are the most feasible states in a statistical sense. So this opens up the possibility for, for starting from a very uh, simple uh, framework, such as like Francis said, COT or something like that. And then of course we will have to include space, but just for the sake of the argument, let's not talk about spatial relations for now. And let's just think about maybe uh, operational constraints. And then the constraints maybe emerge from the dynamics, and they are not uh, necessarily ontological uh, in, in the in the same layer that that uh, or, or 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 necessary at the ontological level, just emergent. So I wonder, and and the, for example, I give a couple of examples that make this uh, argument feasible. One of them is uh, is called a constant concentration something which is a, a field of research in chemistry or in chemical reactors or something like that, that they focus on certain chemical structures or certain compositions that allow to reach any fixed point you reach for a certain specific molecule, it will have the same concentration. So you can, you can modify, change the system whatsoever. It's going to go somewhere to stay a stable point but you can make sure that whatever, whatever stable point you reach in the phase space, one of the specific molecules will reach a particular value for the concentration, which depends on some of the parameters and so on. So, so these sort of constraints in this case are somehow emergent from the structure. So this is my first question, whether or not you consider the possibility to study maybe from a developmental perspective uh, or evolutionary developmental perspective, the, the emergence of constraints along the way from little chemical simple systems to all that, of course, in space will have to come in at some point, very early, I guess. And, <laughs> and, and, and the second question is the idea of function. Uh, I, I would like to see, because I, I feel that if we dig deeper into the notion of function, maybe we can get a sort of connection between the emergence of constraints uh, the potential emergence of constraints and uh, and and the, the sort of ideas you were presenting. So, okay, summarizing, can we expect constraints to be emergent from the structure and the dynamics and maybe create a narrative, a story of how those constraints emerge in, in the, along the way in evolution? And second, what would be then a, a function? So very oh, oh, simple, but Big question. <laughs> yeah, no, the, <laughs> second, the second one is, uh, is more simple because I, I work more on that and I uh, explicitly try not to enter too much into the first one. Uh, so, um, I mean, there is, of course, a, a philosophical debate about what is emergence. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, we, we wrote a paper about that. Um, I do not know if we need. Uh, too strong notion of emergence here. I I have been I'm a bit um, a bit uh, suspicious about the need of invoking strong emergence. What I can say is that uh, the way I see constraints is in terms of characterization is they are characterized by defined by the fact they exhibit a, a conserved property with respect to a certain uh, flow. A thermodynamic flow as a total time scale. Do you do you think that this is enough to consider that the constraint is, for that reason, emergent uh, configuration? I would tend to say yes. It is emergent. It's because it is irreducible. You can the constraint by definition is irreducible to the thermodynamic flow with respect to which it is exhibit a conservation. But of course, is for a certain time scale. Uh, so my answer would be, 
if we talk about emergency in that sense, so uh, I would say yes, constraints are emergent, but the emergency is purely Cartesian in terms of irreducible relations. At some point, there is a configuration of relations that makes that object irreducible to the flow. Uh, but of course, this is a very, yes. If you allow me to intervene, I, I didn't want it to, to, to put the, the problem of defining emergence in the, in, the, in the question. I mean more like just a, a set of kind of high level reduced possibilities, like emergence, just thinking on, on possible futures, like uh, kind of pre preset uh, uh, possible futures at a higher level, like in the sense of chemical organization theory whether organizations are emergent following the, 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 the whole debate of emergence is not the relevant part of the question. But we know that if we have a complex system, it's a, it's a future, it's generally uh, not uh, ergodic in, in the sense that all the possible things will happen with the same likelihood, but certain things tend to happen yeah. much more than others. Then at a the global level, you can reduce the set of possibilities. And, and these things I called in my in my argument, I meant those things to be emergent, but okay, not so really I digging think. into the debate of emergence. So okay, whether okay. these things will, will somehow uh, maybe express the natural, let's say, possible emer emergent, again, abusing of the word emergent, constraints of the system, that's yeah. sort of the, the thinking. In that case, the, 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 the main reference that I have is uh, a paper written by Stuart Kaufman, uh, which, in my view, then is not a constraint, which is the right object, which is, but is biological organization as a whole. Uh, Kaufman has written a paper with my, one of my collaborators, uh, Mike Montevideo and Giuseppe Longo, about the fact that biological, the evolution of biological organization is such that you cannot pre-state uh, its possibilities. So there is not pre-defined -de -pre uh, phase space that allows you to predict the set of uh, functions that can uh, appear. And that is, they can uh, uh, emerge <laughs> uh, after a certain uh, time. So this is a, a very nice paper that complements what we say, because the question is, so it's not a constraint as such, which is, yes, which is, that is property, but branch organization is, as a set of complexity, match that by exaptation, by different ways, you can see the emergence of new functions, new uh, capacities that were impossible to predict uh, beforehand. And for Stuart Kaufman and, and Mael, this is specifically biological. So in biology, you have a problem such that you cannot provide a phase state, uh, phase, uh, state, uh, phase phase. that uh, once for all. Uh, and that makes a mathemat huge mathematical difference with, as if uh, they understand it correctly, with anything else in science. Uh, so I guess this goes more in your, <laughs> in your direction. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I, I just, if, if I might, I mean, uh, please, uh, moderator, just uh, shut me up whenever it's needed. <laughs> <laughs> Starting from very now, like, but but I think that uh, this idea of, of uh, not expecting a face space, um, it's it's not so much of an obstacle because the dimension of the face space can grow and change, and this is something that has been done in in other fields in science as well. Like for example, just to just to give a, a, an example, in a quantum field theory, you you have you have a something called the Fox space which is the, the union of, of multiple kind of possibilities of having one particle, two particles, three, and so on until infinite. So you start from, from the possibility and, and, you, and, and this is not never going to be realized. I mean, in the reality, <laughs> in the quantum thing maybe, but in the reality, you only have two particles or you only have three particles, but, but you start from the potentiality of, of having such a thing. And I think in, in biology is, is more or less the same idea that that you have a very vast maybe kind of a left think five potential of things kind of very very large set of possibilities in a, in a non countable way maybe even and but but never the the uh, biological yeah. system is realizing the whole at the same time so it's a developmental process so it's exploring this set of potentialities and and this is compatible with uh, with only with phases phase spaces that change its dimension. 
So it's not fixed dimension, this I agree, but, but we can also develop theories for, for evolvable phase spaces, as it, yeah, as it actually, is a little bit done in, in quantum theory, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, Stuart's argument is not that this, this characteristic prevents us from doing biological science. The argument is that we need to make to do biological science a different way to for taking to take it account in specificity. So that's maybe something that uh, goes in. Yeah, and, and 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 that's what I think that that these changes of, of phase space structure, like adding new dimensions and adding new molecules, new reactions or new uh, possibilities, new uh, affordances for whatever it's creating the molecules. Um, this is not entirely at random as well. There are the structure is so strong that it really manifests at, at the structural changes. So I don't think we 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 have to expect to be in in a in a kind of completely uh, psychedelic world where everything is happening. I think that the exploration is kind of pretty structured, and 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 perhaps just to complement, uh, this is what we are trying to do in our in our current project is to study like how changing. The structure of a reaction network will map to certain different uh, affordances for it. So I like this word affordances, or in the language of Varela, cognitive autonomy, which I, I like it even better. Uh, uh, is that it's like you have a certain structure, then it gives you certain possibilities, certain structural and dynamical possibilities, which allow for certain things to happen, whatever depending on the on the conditions, of, which then kind of can be observed as constraints co-created by the structure, by the kinetic laws, and whatever other kind of a place or, or setting in which the dynamics is happening with space, without space. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, to, to I don't know if this, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of opening the, the conversation more than asking. <laughs> uh, just so uh, part of the, the, the idea of the the, the innovation that can happen through evolution. So uh, what Stuart and Miley was mentioned, what they are thinking about are specifically functional innovations. So the fact that biological systems, organisms uh, invent new ways of unexpected and uh, unconceivable ways of uh, producing new functions. And uh, so what we mean by functions, so as you know, there is probably know there is a debate about uh, different theories of functions what because the term is used in many uh, science of uh, biological science or uh, and but no one really knows if it, uh, it, it is allowed to, is it is legitimate or not to use this, this word because it has a theological and uh, normative dimensions so you can think that in terms of evolution functions are adaptations uh, or in a very the other solution is very systemic way of thinking a function is just the contribution of a part to produce a, a systemic effect uh, and what we did is to try to find a sort of middle way and say no uh, if you think the theory of autonomy works then you have a way to, de to define functions which is are all the constraints subject to closure so when you say this thing as a functions, what you are indicating, what you are denoting is a structure that has a useful, useful effect to maintaining the system and its condition of existence depends at least in part uh, uh, on the fact that they are member of the systems. So a biological function, you have a way of defining function from within the theory of autonomy. And this, way of defining functions is it has a systemic flavor of course but uh, relies on self-determination so it also the fact that you can ask a function only to system that are uh, self-determined so that are organisms and uh, or uh, see if you or, or you can ask a function to to non-living systems if you can show that they are part of larger organizing self-organized organization so uh, a machine is a function not because is a self-determining entity it is unable to maintain itself but it has been conceived by a by a system a, a social system that indeed realizes closure and in, as a part of the strategies to, to maintaining itself, it produces artifacts. 
So, you know, so that's uh, uh, so if there is indeed uh, the short answer is there is indeed a way of defining function from within the theory. Who would like to comment now or ask the question? Uh, well, um, the idea of the hierarchy of regulators, there is one simple formalism to do it. I don't know whether you know it, perceptual control theory of uh, mm. build powers and such, which is a feedback uh, a driven thing, but which is very simple in the sense that you have one higher order loop that sets the reference point or the set point of the loop below. And the higher order one can take into account, as you call it, the context. That means in one context, it will put a particular set point. In another context, it will put another set point. And it's a very simple scheme. I can immediately do it on the board. I think it's too simple for these kind of things. <laughs> but it allows you to build a hierarchy with many different control levels in a very neat way with uh, and you can calculate it and so on so it's kind of i would say an intermediate step between the more rich formalism we are looking for and then the traditional feedback loop formalism which we know which we agree is too simple but i think it, it is one way of expressing a constraint in the notion of a feedback loop namely the constraint is on the reference level to which the feedback loop tries to converge but that's reference level if itself the output of higher order feedback loop which is itself controlled by a certain reference level and like that you can have reference levels that are more and more abstract from self-maintenance at the top to keeping one particular variable at a particular value at the bottom yeah i would be interested to, to see this this format uh, this allows me to to go back to a point well, I, I can maybe immediately draw it because it's so incredibly simple So the feedback loop is just the loop. Here is the goal of the feedback. Which the goal could be, for example, to keep a certain level of glucose. But then the goal needs to action. Action could potentially undergo a perturbation. And the combination of perturbation action leads to a new perception. So this is a sensor. But now, what do you do to add the control level? You just do this and you put a goal of the second level. So if this is goal two and this is goal one. So what the goal does here is it perceives some additional variables and its action consists in setting the goal up to one of the levels below. Yeah. And then, of course, you can put up as many levels as you want. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it looks uh, uh, going in the same direction. Uh, I, I have to go to another seminar. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, there is one uh, conceptual problem with regulation. Uh, that I, I was mentioning that there are two parts of, of a regulatory system. One is the second order constraint that operates, that modulates the, the activity, the behavior of the first order, the lower level of constraint. But you also need a sensitive constraint. So you need, that's what, that's to me is the more tricky conceptual issue because if you, you need a qualitative distinct, distinction between first order and second order. Otherwise, that makes you a, a, a sort of distinction between we are still at the same order and then we are just going up. So the solution that we have is this idea of context dependence, meaning that to be part of a regulatory system, it means that you're, you do not, uh, you are not needed all the time. It means that what you do is not something that going, is constitutive of the self-maintenance of the system. So actually, it's something, if, if there is no a regulatory uh, subsystem is such that is defined in a way that if there is no perturbation, this regulatory subsystem never operates yep. by definition. 
And that was the main theoretical point that you raised. Is, is that correct to define uh, a regulatory system to, be, to, to, to as a criteria, as the fundamental criteria that gives you the hierarchy? Because otherwise, there is no clear way <coughs> to draw the boundary. Because if regulatory functions are always operating, then you, we thought that the simple fact that they can operate on top of others doesn't give you a, a sufficient criteria to discriminate the, the two hierarchical orders. So we added explicitly the fact that your regulatory system only operates because of changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems that it works. So we, we, we did not find that No, 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 no. I, I think that it's essential that the, the higher is. order, by definition, is at a slower time scale. The lower order is regulating things on the moment, but if then the context changes, then the lower order one may need to be set to a different set point. Yeah. So the, the idea of the higher order is that the higher order, most of the time it stays the same, but in occasionally when the context changes, it tells the lower order one to work uh, in a different way. While the lower order one is, is acting on a much shorter time scale, it's much more. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We didn't know if it's correct to the, we're hesitating whether it is a good strategy to say that well, a, a regulatory function is a function that might be useless. Because if there were, if there is no relevant perturbation, no. you do not. No. Uh, yes, you, you, you need to. Yeah, one thing that is, this model is taken as if there is something. The whole the whole mechanism is, is a stable system that we are investigating, but this is neglecting all development developmental aspects of the system, phylogenetic and ontogenetic because this system just as a biological system it it is not only biological it is also biographical so there is a certain trajectory of how this came to be yeah. and not only that but this is only this is an imperfect uh, an imperfect uh, instance of the evolutionary process maybe in 10000 years or a million years there will be something much more efficient that will do away with half of the, with half of more of the components and uh, maintain this, this same autonomy. So here when we speak, both when we speak about constraints and the, these loops of regulations, etc., I think it's, it's also valuable to think how this came to be. So how, and uh, also relating to what uh, Thomas uh, started to say about emergence, uh, that anything that we see as a constraint is actually an, a, a, is a residue of an event of symmetry breaking somewhere in the developmental trajectory of the system. Mm -hmm. And we can trace back from even, uh, I, I was thinking about this, uh, one of the things that you, uh, one of the points that you made is that the insulin is also making inhibition on the beta cells. But when you said this, it was a quite, a, a quite a, on one hand surprising and not so surprising because, okay, this is a biological agent that operates on all the cells of the body. And it's like language, you are saying a word and everybody in this room will understand something slightly different and will react in a slightly different manner. So these beta cells are also uh, responding to insulin function as uh, for uh, glucose intake. They are not only, so they have multiple functions because, because they understand insulin as, as a linguistic uh, token in a slightly different manner than other cells. Yeah. So, and I, 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 that's, I have many things to say. What, what is that uh, about functional? Functional. If we have it in mind, the idea that an organism has emerged by differ progressive differentiation yeah. of something that was undifferentiated, it is. It seems obvious that functional interaction are extremely complex, and that. A same structure can do different things and interact because 
these parts have not been designed to do one thing. It's just because yes. the, the, the so I, I, I'm very sensitive to this aspect because the, the default hypothesis for me is that, uh, especially if, if you are looking at uh, lower level entities, uh, they will be interacting in many ways with many aspects. So functional descriptions are presumably approximate, very complex, and implies decisions. So we, we sort of approximation about, well, this is doing this and that, but actually it's not that, that simple. So for me, this goes with the very origin of the system. And what you're saying, uh, and Thomas was mentioning development, actually one of the template of projects that are now involved in is about development. So how do we make sense of development by using these ideas? So how constraint differentiate? Uh, is there uh, uh, innovations? So development as part of development is that it reproduces the same organization, but this same is very in a very in a huge approximation. And how innovation can also how there is innovation also in uh, developmental processes. So not only in evolution, but also during development. And also, so is how autonomy explains development and how development explains autonomy. So there is the theory tries to give that hints about uh, how these systems emerge and also how autonomous systems emerge through development. Yes, I would add uh, one one more concept to this: autonomy, autonomy development, and openness. Because every autonomy while developing op operates in it's like an open system, yes, and its its functionality is not prescribed a priori. Coming to say that uh, we look at it as a regulatory system because it caters to our understanding and try trying to to make sense of what is it. But this is our point of view. The system as a system doesn't know what it can do. And there is uh, even Spinoza, this uh, uh, one uh, quote by Spinoza that I like very much. We don't know what the body can do, but also the body don't, doesn't know what it can do until something happens and it does it or dies. And this is, and this is, very, this is very fundamental understanding of the openness of all these bio, uh, biological autonomous systems. It's, it's, it's really fundamental in, in my eyes, and even more, to some extent, more uh, important than uh, regulation or uh, almost as this autonomy, etc. It's the openness of the, autonom the autonomous system that makes it alive in this kind of. We have huge debates uh, precisely at this point because some of us tend to emphasize the, the moving aspect of the system, the fact that it continuously changed that. The, and some others tend to say, yes, but at the same time, you have to explain how these physically impossible entities actually exist. Uh, and so I think that there is no choice to be done. So a good theory of organization it goes with an explanation of the system is constantly undergoing change. Uh, yeah. And also, how you do not have two coordinates that are exactly the same. But I would not, I, my tendency is to say, try not to uh, uh, neglect one aspect or the other, because uh, it, is, it seems to me quite obvious that part of the story is that we are done in a, in a certain way, with are very strange physical systems, that and for that reason, we are able to uh, innovate, constantly innovate. And uh, actually, uh, uh, Mael Montevi, my one of the main co-authors, strongly emphasized that aspect. So that's why I wrote that paper with Kaufman saying that we cannot restate uh, the evolution of, of the system. Yes, and it's because uh, it's beyond biology, it's more philosophy. Because <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> when you say theory, what is it? It's in this sense, I'm now reading a book by Simon Don that makes a very, very uh, interesting point that knowledge itself is a relationship mm -hmm. and it's a dyna dynamic relationship and not necessarily convergent to a specific point so we don't aiming to reach some something like perfect knowledge is like 
if that's the if I may, we, we, we tried something in that direction because uh, if we want to be serious take serious the idea that an autonomous system is a system that is is the result of a specific ontogenetic epigenetic history that makes that in yes, a yes. that that you can say some you can express some aspects that that are general but that there is a, a irreducible specificity of this system because of its own history not only you have to take that into account but the question is how to inject that in a model yes how do we express the fact that in this model there is something that almost by construction we can we do not know and that this system is going to behave or behave as the theory predict only to a certain extent only for a certain time and my motive is this uh, yes that's that's right. can we also invent a way of expressing that in theory not just conceptually in theory and in a moment so uh, uh, to that I was like when you were showing it I was I was wondering if like this cannot be actually done by adding to your model uh, what what you call this regulatory level or regulatory order like a third order which which would be I don't you know name it how how you want evolution reality like everything else that would for example act by kind of like. Uh, the the death of this of this organization would be the function of this of this regulatory system. So because for example when you have an auton uh, autonomy of this operational closure, the death of the system is kind of like a failure, yes. Mm -hmm. But for this regulatory like outside of the organism, the death of this of the organization would be just a function of like regulation. You know. <laughs> so uh, okay, okay, th this doesn't work. You know. So th th this sort of and and that like any autonomy is uh, is just an experiment of this. Of That's this. relative. You want to say? Yeah, it's, it's just not it's, it's just an experiment gone wrong, and, and all those uh, all those autonomies are just you know like trials on different organizations of sort. Yeah? Because I, I I keep wondering like why why like why death is a problem and not not the like like a seriously taken feature of the biological organization. You know? So uh, oh, I, I, I would uh, say yeah. two things that to a, to, a, to a first approximation, mm -hmm. death it is fa many failure. It's just the fact that you are no, no more able to to maintain yourself. So in a sense, is that when this doesn't work anymore, you, you die. Yeah, so it's outside of your model in a sense, you know, like it's it's but, not. Um, yeah, it, so um, you can also um, locate that in a wider context in a sense that death of individual organisms is not necessarily bad for a higher system where your organic individual is, is located of course so understanding death in biology has to be located beyond the individual yeah. for the individual i honestly do not know exactly what the advantage of, 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 uh, of dying for me having uh, conducted the experiment well, the maybe it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but of course death is an important part it is a, as a function beyond the individual mm -hmm. I, I cannot i cannot express death as a function for an individual yeah but that's yeah, yeah, no, 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 exactly no. beyond the individual. I, I think it touches the point that you started to say before about the unknown because the boundary between the viability of the system like the con continuation of self maintenance and the collapse or the disintegration of uh, of that same system on the boundary, all the interesting things will happen, the ones that are unknown yet. Because suppose that there is a system which is self-maintaining, and then there comes a perturbation of the once in a lifetime perturbation that you don't know, and you cannot even simulate in a laboratory because you don't know what it is. And then you look at it and you're like, okay, for sure this tsunami will destroy everything. And then <laughs> it finds a way to keep on maintaining itself yeah. and it changes yeah. and this is this is what is interesting this is what is interesting that's it, that's what, it, this is why death is, is, death important. is an important part of for the theory of evolution in general I mean, yes yes exactly if there is no death and no selection so i mean no, any kind so of course 
as soon as you go beyond the, 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 the scale of the individual, <coughs> there are many senses in which death is important. Yes, and it's embarrassing not to know. It's very embarrassing to ask you I mean, not to know. Why? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> because we want to know all the time. <laughs> yeah. And also, you see, there are also uh, the Bermuda processes that involves cell death. Yeah. Um, so, I have a, yeah, I have a, a so we I have a, I have a small question that that goes in the same direction than the emergent questions of of, of Thomas and, and and about the openness of the system. So let's say you you mentioned quickly that if we see food already the insulin starts. Hmm? There are experiments to show that, I suppose, no? Yeah. Yeah. But, but my question is then more on the experimental level. That is this that is this open border, I think, where indeed things will become more complex than probably the model that that is being tried out here. Huh? Uh, when, when cognition starts to in to, to interfere. Hmm? So my question is, are there more subtle experiments that have been tried out. For example, if we see publicity, publicity for food, it will also give some insulin, I suppose, already. But even that is still causal. Huh? One thing makes a process going. I suppose that on this open border where cognition starts to interfere with biology, that things will even not be modeled as processes anymore, I suppose. There will be there will be not uh, a nice feedback mechanism even there will be correlations that happen influences that go in both ways perhaps even other other type of influences even not even certain that you can present it by functions I think well it's a possibility at least but I was asking yeah. you do you know what experiments that have been done there. Not not very well. I know we make uh, we select a couple of examples for this paper, and uh, Anna Soto was mentioning to me that this is now there are more and more uh, experiments showing that. Uh, it, I, I remember that she was mentioning for brain uh, brain effects on uh, on the pancreas actually, and that that was something that was not uh, that explored, and that we know more and more about that. So what I know is that is, is a well-established uh, experimental evidence that uh, actually what happens is that when we see food, uh, we, we start uh, salivating. This is what, so something that we know actually, we know that we start salivating when we see seafood, even well before that we actually consume food. So we start producing insulin so that we prepare ourselves for that situation. Uh, I, 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 I don't know well the, the experimental literature, but uh, Anna said me that this is, is relatively new respect to older classical uh, models, but uh, well recognized today. Yeah, they are very difficult experiments, but I follow a little bit the experiments of vision. Uh, that's, of course, a completely other thing, and, and, and there are a lot of experimentation, and more and more it becomes clear that 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 the way that that the way the brain man manages vision is really very complex you know it's not this interface is incredibly complex what happens there yeah. uh, quite recent experiment even that is so amazing makes makes it clear that that there is like in 10 minutes lapse in time even if we look and we kind of memorize things that are 10 minutes ago and not all of it, of course, eh? but let's say that that is structurally happening. Uh, this is all all new new experiment research, yeah? but of course it indicates that probably the same kind of complexity will happen in on that interface where cognition comes in yeah, on, exactly. on on these kind of models. Yeah, yeah. and actually, in this case. Uh, uh, brain uh, in, 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 um, effects on uh, on the parkas is something that could still be below cognition if we go if we actually cognition a, a stronger sense. But as you say, if we start also including cognitive capacities in this in this picture, things become extremely complex. Of course, uh, there are more and more evidence that. Uh, we have anticipatory capacities that uh, 
modulate our behavior, biological behavior. So uh, this is a very simple case. I think, in a sense, this is a very simple case. It's just the fact that the brain induces salivation in advance. But as you are, you are saying, uh, we can find more, much more complex uh, uh, examples experimentally, uh, study the example of, of anticipation and the interferences. Yeah, I agree. And how do you think that this kind of complexity will, will have an influence on the deep nature of these models? Actually, there is, uh, from the very beginning, uh, the theory of autonomy, uh, because part of one of the of these uh, pioneers is Francisco Varela. And Varela has worked a lot on cognition, actually, he mainly worked on, uh, in neurosciences. So from the very beginning, there is a question about how uh, biological autonomy and cognitive autonomy have to be integrated. And uh, there is a debate, but in my, as far as I can tell, this debate is not advancing that fast because there are two, two ways of understanding the question is, well, one way is, is considering cognition as a, as a complex biological phenomenon, but more or less we can make sense of biological autonomy with the tools that we have for biological autonomy, cognitive autonomy with the tools for biological autonomy. And there are other, other authors that are not satisfied with that, saying, well, no, when we enter into cognition, uh, yes, you can say there is autonomy, self maintenance, etc., but uh, cognitive system explore a much wider uh, uh, space of capacities that I have an analogy with, let's say, autopoiesis, but that is some sort of analogy. So we, we need a different theory, and then once we have a second theory for cognitive autonomy, then try to unify the two theories. But not try simply to reduce cognition to biological. Uh, one, one aspect is, is uh, teleology. Uh, the fact that we have biological system try to survive. Cognitive systems do much more complex things that in some cases are actually in conflict with, we make stupid things <laughs> that can, uh, make uh, put our, our existence in danger. That, makes, that means that we need a very complex theory that uh, articulate the levels with, without reducing one to the other in a too quick way. So this, this, is, this is a debate that exists in this domain. I see. Thank you. And I also want to thank for your talk. I learned a lot of new things again. <laughs> so it was a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's always good to see details like that about somebody who has gone very deep to, of course, everybody has heard a little bit of that, but if you don't see the details, it's very fascinating. And I, I assure you that each time I forget the biological details. So each time you have to what, uh, you have to go back and say, wow, well, what is, was doing this part and that part it is incredible. Which is the, what is the opposite of doing the better seven? <laughs> Uh, and I had something to add. Yeah, yes, uh, there is, uh, going back to the um, one point about the modeling, uh, is that if we um, take for granted that the, 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 the history of the organism makes, that, in the history of variation, that each individual has undergone in his ontogenetic evolutionary history, may mean that we need to introduce in the models, a sort of operator or something that represents history. And we have had a discussion about this. This is very strange for natural science to introduce something that says we do not know something. And, uh, but uh, we are quite convinced that a, a good modeling, so part of the modeling requires solving this problem of complexity and the object that we need. And part of the problem is can we uh, make justice of this historical specificity of the organs? Something that we can put into the model source to make that clear that we are going to describe have a partial description by definition. Yes. 
And uh, so if you're interested, we, we have one paper that tries to go in that direction. But, uh, but yeah, it's just, it's a very strange history. But, um, For me, this sounds like a, like a profound uh, you know, paradigm shift if like models will start to include that, uh, rather include themselves in the, like what we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 if I may, I uh -huh. what was worse we are discussing is the fact that when you, when biologists run experiments, uh -huh. right, for instance, on animals or mice, how do they constitute their, their sampling? Because they know that the two mice will not going to be identical. If you take two mice at random, you are pretty sure that they are not going to be the same level. So what they do? They take brothers. They take uh, clones even it's clones exactly so <coughs> what they do is they circumvent they try to circumvent the problem of history by taking uh, specimens that are very close in terms of the history yeah, in birth states yeah <laughs> and even in that case so most experiments are run like that yeah. so these biologists know that they cannot just consider that organisms are the same organisms this is clearly false <laughs> But at the same time, we have either we shut up or we just give make science for one individual at a certain point, at a certain moment, because tomorrow is going to be different. So they find ways which are somehow efficient, effective to uh, uh, select entities that um, we can expect do not have not diverged too much because of the common history. So that's part of the reason why this can be captured by this this this, this knowledge, which is practical knowledge, is not does not appear in the models. And then this part be part of a theory of autonomy, because it's not in contrast with autonomy. It's one of the aspects of autonomy. Yeah, like, you know, like coming back to the like out like outside regulator of the of the experiment of, yeah. of life you know they they do differ a lot and even if they are like you know identical twins like they invest entire kind of psychologically entire like you know power to differentiate themselves you know yeah. so it's like you you want those entities to be as different as possible even in the situation as the regulator you know yeah the, yeah, yeah. The, so in a sense oh. this is i answered the, the, the thomas question before so <laughs> if this sense, we think there's a sort of a emergence in this sense, biological emergence. And then, yes, then it would be useful to think about that and integrate that into the theory. Yes, this is a problem of a complex system because uh, if we consider, like, what an example that I, a counter example that I was thinking about is in astronomy, where they have a theory of development of stars by just observing a lot of stars at different uh, stages of star formation. So we have a pretty good, uh, pretty good theory about how stars uh, emerge or how they individuate or come, come to be. But this is, uh, this is valid on, under the assumption that stars are relatively very simple in the sense mm. of, of the physical processes that are taking place. So we yeah. can look at different instances and just combine them into a kind of a timeline. This is uh, yeah. in, in living systems, that's, that's uh, far from being the case. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I, I, see, I, mean, I, um, I do think that these, uh, these questions can be emerge from the fact that we grant systems the fact of being autonomous because yes. this sort of in, in, in internal capacity of of self-fabrication etc makes them special and one of the is the, the manifestation of, the, of this of the peculiarity is the fact that they change over time so i see remember the two aspects as being two aspects of the same the same theoretical high in a sense. Yes, it's like a bounded system that all the time reflects all its environment. And by that, yeah. it becomes a reflection of all the environment. And the environment is not bounded to, uh, by the change. So what, what, is, what is the bounding factor? It's the autonomy of the system. Yes, this yeah. is the yeah. bounding yeah. factor. Yeah. And maybe this is also a way to, uh, to explain uh, philosophically speaking, I'm not speaking about the biological aspect, uh, uh, the, the, how, 
how to introduce constraints. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. I'm just sorry because our time has ended. So, would it be okay that we close here I and we continue know. in the we in the bar? <laughs> <laughs> we cannot take you on Zoom, guys. Uh, with us. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, we, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Madame. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, that, that was really, really amazing. So, uh, so we are finishing for today. Um, I have now shared also the screen of the announcement of the next uh, seminar that we will have in two weeks. Alvaro Moreno will be speaking about an autonomy uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, how this produces agency, uh, a natural and artificial system. So it's not in a week, it's in two weeks from now, same time. Same week, same room. So thank you and right. see you in the